Thank you. My emotions are running hot today, uh, so let me just start off with some prayer. Uh, Father, I just I come to you now, Lord. Um, God, I do pray that uh, you will put my emotions in check right now. God, there is uh, so much I want to say, and I'm eager to say this morning. So I pray that you would calm my nerves and calm my heart. And uh, Lord, speak to us through your word. God, um, just as you have broken me into pieces and you've moved me uh, in places that I never thought I'd go, I pray that uh, today the words uh, would move people. God, that you'd break the pavement of our heart and just open us and uh, move us as we hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of you have been asking, when am I going to hear about this trip to Latvia uh, that you took? And uh, the day is finally here. If you're here visiting with us today uh, and don't know what this is all about, this title might seem a little strange, The Unwanted. Uh, it's kind of an unusual title for a sermon, and that, that is intentional. Uh, what my family and I did this past summer, uh, we spent uh, about half a month in a country um, that was... that basically just got its freedom back for the last 20 years. Um, and we spent a, a time in an orphanage, or really it's kind of a halfway house or kind of an alternate home. Uh, most of these kids are probably not going to get adopted. Um, but the title, Unwanted, uh, kind of stuck for a couple of reasons. I like Westerns, and I've always kind of wanted to put my face on a wanted poster. <laughs> this is the closest I could ever get was an unwanted poster, maybe. Um, but also, as I was going around the orphanage, it hit me uh, really hard that these kids were unwanted, uh, that somebody didn't want them, and that's why they were there. Um, and that was really hard for me to deal with. Uh, so that's the title of our sermon today. So I got to lay a little bit of groundwork to, to what built us up to doing a trip like this. Uh, there were some questions that I had been wrestling with, uh, just trying to just get through. And some of these questions are going to seem quite obvious. Um, if you've got an insert in your bulletin today, I am not going to slow down for you guys to, to keep up with me, because if I don't keep moving, we'll never get through this and you'll be here all day. Uh, so if you're trying to follow me in scripture, there is an insert that has the scriptures. It's a fill in the blank style like you're accustomed to. So you'll have to fill in the blanks. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. So th there's four questions that, that are obvious questions that kind of lay the found, foundation for why it is that I would do something like go to Latvia and spend a half a month with a bunch of unwanted kids. And one of the questions that I ask myself is this. It says, does God care for the needy? It's an obvious question, right? It's very simple. Everybody in here probably, well, yeah, of course he does, right? Well, I needed to prove this. I needed to kind of lay this out for myself. So what I'm going to do is kind of walk you from the Old Testament to the New Testament and show you that Yes, God cares for the needy. Not only does He care for the needy, it is such a dominant theme in the Bible that you can't miss it. In fact, from Old Testament to the New Testament, it's the same God, and it's the same words that you'll hear echo throughout. So we start uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the, the Egyptians. This is the birth of the nation of Israel. This is really, they come to Israel, or they come to Egypt kind of under peaceful terms, but they leave in very hostile terms. They're captives. They, they started off with a pharaoh that was kind and, and generous to them. And then before they knew it, they were being oppressed. They were captives. And then God came in and did this miracle thing to them. The, it says here in Deuteronomy, The Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us. They imposed hard labor on us. And then we cried out to the Lord. I gave you one blank there, so if you're following along. Uh, the God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. And he, he, and he has brought us to this land flowing with milk and honey. Notice the terms here. He heard them. He saw them. He took his arm and reached out to them. I love these terms. Then we get into Psalms. It says, The unfortunate commit himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan or the fatherless. I cannot help but think of the Sagers when I read this passage now, that I know that she is fatherless. But you know, she's not, she may have lost her earthly father, but she's never lost her heavenly father. And it says again here in Psalm, O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. 
You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed. God's ear is always inclined to those who are less fortunate. It's very, very stark here. Then you get to the New Testament. And this is, this is really Jesus. is the first time he's kind of stood up in the New Testament and spoke in a congregation like this. He comes in and he, and he kind of, kind of an inauguration speech almost of sorts. And he, and he came, that is Jesus, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. And he stood up to read to them from the book of Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Notice that's the first thing he has to say. Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who were downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus preached the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Notice how he starts this sermon. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Notice he did not say, blessed is you, the middle class. Blessed is you who can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Blessed is you who are a self-made man. No, blessed is the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons I think here. Because the poor recognize their need. They know they need God. Notice the people that are coming into the kingdom. It's not the people that have been self-made. It's the people that can admit that they need God. It's the people that know that when they come to the table and they look before a holy God, they bring nothing to the table. That they can't save themselves. They can't merit their salvation. Only God can save you. Next question that I wrestled with. Uh, should we care for the poor? Hey, it's fine and dandy that God wants to care for the poor, right? Just leave me well enough alone from this, right? So I think some of us, this is where some of us live. This is where I lived for, for a good part of my life is, you know, it's great God wants to take care of the poor, but leave me out of it. But that's not what his word says. That's not what he commands. Going back to Deuteronomy again. If there is a poor man among you, one of your brothers is any of in any of the towns of the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand to, to, to your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. I hear a clear command there. You should live with your possessions loosely. You should not live with your possessions with a clenched fist. Open your hand. Hold on to your possessions loosely. Then we get to Proverbs. Proverbs, is, Proverbs 31 is probably... A lot of women know this verse, uh, or this, this chapter. This is the Proverbs 31 ministry. This is, this is a, a, a mother speaking to her son who happens to be a king. And this, she's giving him words of advice. And this is the kind of woman that she is trying to tell her son, the king, how, who she should go after. The son, the king, represents a person of influence, a person that has a voice, somebody that can speak up. I believe... We in America are very blessed. I believe everybody here is a person of influence, and everybody here has a voice. To some level, we all are people of influence. And I think when she speaks to her son, I think she's speaking to us as well. She says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And then she goes on, she starts talking about the kind of woman that this guy should marry. Look at, look at how she describes her. She opens her arms to the poor. Or she, she opens her hand, as another uh, version might say, and she extends her hands to the needy. Notice the involvement in these verses. This woman is personally involved. She's not just opening her hands with possession. She's reaching out with the other hand and pulling them up. She's involved. She's inconvenienced. She's not just sitting on the sidelines, waiting for somebody else to take care of business. She's putting herself in, personal, in a personal relationship with these people. One of the things that kind of struck me as I was going through Proverbs is some of us a lot of times will pray and we'll wonder, well, why doesn't God not answer my prayer? Um, one of the things that really struck out at me when studying about the poor, it says uh, in Proverbs, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. 
Have you ever wondered, well, is it there possibly a reason why God does not answer my prayer? It says here, God does not answer some because they don't listen to the poor. And I, it struck me, you know, that the, some of the greatest hindrance to our prayer could be the fact that we don't listen to those around us. So therefore, God does not listen to us. Anyhow, getting back into the New Testament, John the Baptist, uh, when he was asked, uh, why should we care or should we care for the needy? He said this, uh, say to them, let the man with two tunics share with him who has none and let him who has food do likewise. And then again in Matthew, now we have the, the words of Jesus, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. These are pretty clear commands. Jonathan Edwards, not the politician, but the theologian, he uh, probably is most known for uh, writing uh, his, his work on the sinners in the hands of an angry God. But he did a lot of other interesting things. And he had a title of a sermon uh, called The Christian Duty for the Poor, Explained and Enforced. And in that, this is what he said. He says, this duty is absolutely commanded and much insisted on in the Word of God. Where have we any command in the Bible laid down in stronger terms and a more absolute urgent manner than the command of giving to the poor? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I just could not agree more. Uh, when you put your blinders on and you start looking for the poor in the Bible, they, it will jump out. So much so that you, it, it'll move you. All right. So it's in the Bible. It's everywhere. It's a command. That should be enough for us to want to do it. But I've asked an additional question, well, why? Why else? Well, God's commands usually, they benefit us. If we follow His commands, they, there's usually something good in it for us. There's also the, this, just the fact that He did command it. That should be enough. But is it enough? I think ultimately there's a bigger reason that we follow any command that God gives us, and that's this. Paul says it well in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, I really don't want you to miss this. I did not get up here to brag about my family and what we did and how we did it. And more than anything, I want you to hear my heart on this, is we don't do it for us. We do it for His name. And I, this is one of those verses, I think, when you see at the football stadium, you see John three sixteen. I think 1 Corinthians 10, 31 should be right next to it. Do it all for the glory of God. That's why we do anything, is we do it for His glory. Um, also, he says it in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are just jars of clay, little vessels, carrying around His salvation, speaking to the glory of God. This is the foundation that God put us in. We are trophies of His glory. We're either living for His glory or we're living up for our own. This is a huge theme in the Bible. This is so much so that I'm, I'm not willing to let it go on one slide. I'm going to talk about it for a couple slides. Starting back in Joshua, when Joshua had, had a lot of success, he'd beaten up Jericho, the walls had come down, he goes and he's, there's this little podunk town called Ai, and his troops say, you don't need to bring the whole troops out here. We can take care of these guys, no problem. They're just a little gaggle of people. What he didn't know is somebody in his camp had already committed a sin, and he was not going to win this battle because of this sin. Achan had stole the bacon, so to speak. And what had happened is they lost. Not only did they lost, they had their butts handed to them. So if you read in Joshua 7 9, it's not about the loss that Joshua was upset about. What he's upset about is this this idea that God's name is in jeopardy now. He's crying out to God and he's saying, what will all the nations think of us? What will they think? You know, we, here we go, we, we have this incredible battle, we, we take out Jericho and this little podunk town beats us up. And he's not crying about the loss, he's crying about what will they think about God's name? It's important to him. David and Goliath, this is a great story. He, David comes up to the battle lines and there's this giant Philistine on the other side and he's mocking the armies of the Lord and he's telling, he's just hurling insults on him. And David walks up, he's like, who is this guy? Does he not know that we're God's people? It's his name that David's so concerned about. How is it that this man can insult the name of God? 
and not get punished for it. So what does David do? He picks up a stone and takes him out. I wish I could do that sometimes when somebody are mocking the name of God, but that's, that's not always the, what he wants us to do. Uh, if you read in Solomon, Solomon is about to dedicate the temple, and there's an entire chapter of Solomon just going about talking about the name of God and how this name of God will be, be made great in this temple and that foreigners will be drawn to this temple because of God's great name in this temple. Then the temple gets destroyed. The, the Israelites fall into this bad relationship with God and the temple gets destroyed, but then it gets rebuilt later. And this is even more compelling. Darius, who's a pagan king who I think converted, and there's a whole spot in Ezra where he's talking about rebuilding this temple and how God's name is going to be made great in this temple. Um, then you get to Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is about to face an army of overwhelming odds that really no person should ever win this battle. And before the battle even begins, he starts talking about, God, this is a chance to make your name great. And what does he do? God goes out and he wins the battle for him. And I already mentioned Paul. Paul talks about doing it all for the glory of God. Peter, he gets a butt whooping. He goes in and he, they keep telling him, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Stop preaching in the name of Jesus. So he gets flogged. And what does he do when he gets out of being flogged? The thing he's most happy about is, thank you, God, that I got to do it for your name's sake. So when we do anything, we do it for God's name's sake. It's not for our sake. The Matthew, uh, the gospel writers, they, this was definitely a, a theme in their, their verses as well. Uh, and Matthew says, in his name, the nations will put their hope. Mark says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke says, he was named Jesus, which means Savior. And John, I love the way John plays with the words in the namesake of our God. He says, the word became flesh and the word was God. So this draws me to my third question. So does God care for the needy? Yes. Should we care for the needy? Yeah, it's commanded then the third question really we ought to, to know the answer to is, who are the needy? And I'll be quite honest, this is the one I struggled with the most. This is, this is one I wrestle with even now as I, as I preach this. Um, I, just to kind of give you some background on this, I, I like to try to do things and practical things to try to help out the needy. We, we try to, when every time we go to Baltimore, we try to pack a bag lunch to find a homeless guy to give it to. And, uh, you know, we've, we've come home from Baltimore and there's been a guy on the street, we've given him food, and I've had a guy look at me and said, what is it? You know, kind of like, what, you're begging and you're going to ask me, what is it? You know, so I've had these experiences. And then there's a time where, uh, I think Angry Rob, we were coming out of Blockbuster, I think, one time, and there was a guy, he was standing over at Chili's, he was coming our way, and he kind of smelled like alcohol, and he starts asking for money, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to give this guy my hand. So I said, do, would you like a burger? Would you, I'll go over to McDonald's. I'll get you something to eat and bring you back something. And the guy started verbally assaulting me for offering him food because I wouldn't give him money because I'm sure he wanted to just go out and get more alcohol or something. So there's this idea of what is needy. You know, we live in this society where we've got handouts. The government just, there's this entitlement thing. The less you do, the more the government will give you. Um, so I keep asking myself, well, who are the needy? Um, I'm a little bit jaded, I guess, in my experiences with trying to define who the needy are. So when you get like that, well, turn to Scripture. That's my answer. Turn to Scripture. Well, what does Scripture say? Well, the Scripture has a lot to say about the poor. In fact, the poor are mentioned over 176 times, and we're going to read every single verse this morning. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Just breathe easy. Uh, people in need are mentioned over 300 plus times. It's a continuous theme in the Bible. So this should be really, really easy to spell out, right? Uh, we should walk out of here with a clear picture of the needy. Not, not, not so. Uh, the, uh, let me break it down for you a little bit. There's, there's really four categories that I kind of, that kind of have emerged out of the Bible. When you take this 176 verses, there's the economically poor, there's the socially poor. There's the physical poor, and then there's the spiritual poor. And let me kind of explain each one of these a little bit. Economically poor is just what you think. It's people that, that are not getting ahead in life. And now, I have to qualify this a little bit. When we're talking about the economically poor, and when the Bible talks about the economically poor, this is not talking about people who are not willing to work. The Bible is very clear about people who are not willing to work. It says in Thessalonians, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. This is not, the Bible does not endorse laziness at all. 
Uh, in fact, Tim Keller says 80 to 90 percent of the poor mentioned in the Bible is not about those who are not willing to work. These are people, I think, that are really just they're living in underdeveloped countries or they're living in places where you, it just is you're being oppressed. It's hard to get ahead. Um, so that's what I think the Bible's talking about when it's talking about needy on the economic level. The social level, this is a little bit harder to explain. And uh, this, I think, really actually fits the picture of where we were in Latvia more than anything else, the social, the social need, the socially poor. To help explain this, i turn you to Proverbs. Um, Proverbs is a book that talks about wealth and poverty a lot. If you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you could probably argue that's probably the dominant theme. But it talks about wealth in two terms. It says it, uh, wealth in negative terms in the sense that uh, people are tr not trusting in God. They're trusting in their wealth to kind of get them through life. Or uh, it talks about wealth in the sense that there are people doing it by uh, means that don't have integrity or illegally gained uh, things. So, so that's the negative terms for wealth. But it also talks about wealth in positive terms. It talks about uh, working hard and investing and doing, doing well for yourself. And one of the things, which is in this verse here, it talks about wealth being like a security blanket. Um, so, for example, it says, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city, but the poverty is the ruin of the poor. So, I'm trying to illustrate this for you, this, this social condition of being poor. It's the idea that, okay, if you're wealthy, uh, you, you have walls around you. It's like a fortified city. You have this strength. You have like this, this peace of mind. Now, I know, like the Sager's funeral, one of the things that really struck me was talking about her dad uh, when he was out of work. I know a lot of people in here have been out of work. There's this idea, well, well, if being wealthy makes you feel secure, well, what does being poor make you feel like? And that kind of leads me to this, that there's this feel of anxiety, this, this insecurity, this fear of worry and suspense. You know, you're a, instead of a city with walls, you're a city without walls. You're exposed. Uh, you, you're vulnerable and you're weak and you're subject to all kinds of injustice when you're not wealthy. So this is the, the kind of the, the idea of what a, the social poor leads to. And Tessa's dad was, uh, he, one of the things they were talking about was when he went out for work and we prayed for him in our class all the time, and the man uh, was amazing, uh, had an amazing work ethic, uh, and, and just really tried to find jobs, sending out hundreds of resumes, uh, and finally he lands a job. And uh, one of the things that really was powerful about this is he, he had been laid off from all these other jobs. All these companies had gone out of business, and he really just wasn't treated well. And this is the last job that he had before he died. Uh, he went to go resign because of his health condition because he knew he couldn't work anymore. And he was having a hard time. And they, thank God that he had a boss that was sensitive to this and says, no, we're going to hold your job until you come back. We're going to just have a temp job. Blew me away. Blew me away. Um, anyhow. So there's this plight of the poor. There's this social injustice. This, and it, it, they're, they're vulnerable and they're weak and they don't have a voice. And... Uh, what happens to him in Proverbs, it says, an unplowed field produces food for the poor, but injustice sweeps it away. So we, even what they have is taken from them. It's not like they don't have anything. It's that they're, they're in a disadvantaged position, and what they have is taken from them. In Proverbs 22, 22, it says, do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. This is, this is Latvia. Latvia in 19, early pre-World War II, the Russians flooded the country and just started taking advantage of the country. Um, and then the Germans came in and knocked the Russians out, and they did the similar things. They kind of just oppressed them. And then after the war, the Russians came back in, flooded the country, uh, deported. They had two major deportation days. They, they, they had one day that they, on a single day, they took 15,000 people and just took them out of the country and put them to Siberia. On another day, they took 44,000 people out of the country just because they were either, they were landowners or because they were intelligent or because they were educated to some extent or they were priests. One of the first things the communists did is they took the priests out of the country because it, religion inspires people. And it causes people to rise up. So what did they do? They targeted the priest right away. The pr anybody that had any kind of theological background, you were a target to get out of the country. And if they didn't deport you out of the country, they just killed you. 
And that's the kind of oppression, that's the kind of taking advantage of, the social injustice that occurred in that country. And we got to go over at the heels of this. 1993 was the last time that this was the, the year that the last Soviet troops left the country. So they're, they're really, they're struggling with their freedom. They've been taken advantage of, and it's a very difficult place to go. So let's talk about the oppressors for a second. Proverbs talks about the oppressors. It says, like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over helpless people. Notice the, the subhuman terms. They're not even given human terms. They're talked about as animals, as like beasts, these oppressors. And Proverbs says this also, whoever mocks the poor insults their maker. Whenever, whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. I think of Nebuchadnezzar when I read this verse because he's standing out in front of his vast wealth. He's the, like the champion of the whole kingdom belongs to him and he's sitting there gloating about it. And as he's gloating about it, God strikes him down and he's eating grass like a cow for seven years and he humbles him. I just think of that and I think, wow, God is listening. All right, so then there's this physical component. Uh, this, is, this is more obvious and more easy to un understand and explain uh, a physical need. Poverty often leads to physical hurt. I, I don't know if you've noticed, but when's the last time you saw a homeless dude that looked healthy or looked like, yeah, wow, that guy could run a marathon. You're not going to find a poor guy that looks healthy. Uh, and you'll find this even in Scripture. In Matthew, it says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So you see the physical ailments here. They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're naked, they're sick. All right, then there's the spiritual component to this. This is where we are most like the poor. This is where we share in the same common need. We should never look at the poor as if we're better than them, at somehow that we're blessed and they're not. We should never say that because they share the same spiritual poverty that we share. We all need a Savior. There's none righteous enough to stand before a holy God. So we all share in the spiritual component. All right, so let's apply those four things to Scripture. I've given you some groundwork here. There's this economic, there's this social, there's physical, and then there's this spiritual thing. Let's, let's apply that to some passages and see if we can't find out who the needy are. Let's define them. So there's the story about the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan is usually talked about in terms of the guy that helps the dude that got beat up or you kind of sympathize with the guy that got beat up. But I want to just draw your attention to a couple things. It says here in Luke, a man was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Okay, well, we know he's poor now. He, he has no wealth. They just took it. Uh, we know socially he's probably unacceptable because he's half naked. Uh, physically, he's half dead. And spiritually, we know he shares our same spiritual needs. So he's, he's got all four. But when's the last time you saw a half naked, dead, naked guy sitting on the side of the road? I haven't seen any of those in my life. Okay, well, here's the needy. Where are they? I'm, I'm, we're the half-dead naked guys. I don't know where they are. Um, and then Matthew uh, 5, 44, Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, it's funny, putting that with that story, the Good Samaritan, a lot of times we talk about the, the guy that helps the, the dude that's half-dead naked, and we talk about the guy that's half-dead naked, but we don't talk about the robbers. Notice Jesus says, I tell you, pray for your enemies, love your enemies. The spiritually sick are the enemies. Okay, well, how many of you have enemies? Well, I have a lot of people that kind of take me off and get under my skin. I don't know if I call them enemies, though. I mean, maybe they're enemies. Okay, I pray for them. They're needy. They're spiritually sick. I recognize that. Again, I, I'm, there's not a people group that's really easily defined for me. You know, okay, enemies. Uh, we, don't, we live in a kind of a civil society. Finding your enemies and going out and saying, hey, you're needy, doesn't... It's not easy to do. It's not a, not a clear people group. All right, so then we have the woman at the well. The woman at the well, she's spiritually sick. We know the story about her. She comes up. They start having a little conversation. 
uh, Jesus starts telling her about her spiritual condition before God and kind of telling her, so she knows a little bit about religion going into the conversation, but she doesn't have all the pieces together. So Jesus ends the conversation with this just incredible witness to her and says, well, I am what you're looking for. And she's convinced by the end, you are it, you're right, you know everything about me. So Jesus kind of practiced this, he's clairvoyant, he knows what's going on in this woman's life. I'm not clairvoyant, I'm not going to be able to walk up to the woman on the street and say, hey, you've had five husbands. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. So Jesus had a little something on me here. All right, well, we know she's probably economically poor, maybe, because she's gone through five husbands. Uh, she might be socially poor, well, we know to some extent she is, because the Bible tells us she was going up to the well at a time when nobody else was up there. She's kind of an outcast. She doesn't want to be there in front of people. Um, so she might be physically abused to some extent. She's been through five husbands. And we know that she's spiritually sick. But again, this is a people group. This is the needy. Where are they? How do you go up and how do you find this person? You know, are we hanging out with the prostitutes? Is that what we need to do? Uh, that kind of makes me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, but I'm saying they are spiritually needy. But again, is this a people group that's easy to go approach and go after? Not really. So here's my dilemma. Who are the needy? Spell it out for me, God. And then when, he, when you ask, you, you'll get the answer. One of the two verses that really propelled us into this trip, one of the things that spoke to me as I was wrestling with this idea of who the needy are, this verse came to mind. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, I had already mentioned a bunch of passages in the Old Testament that mentioned the fatherless and the orphans, but this one really hit home. Uh, I, I needed this. I needed the, this people group to be shown to me, and I needed it spelled out for me. And uh, so when Ingrid approached me and said, Hey, I've got an uncle that lives in Latvia, and he's with a bunch of orphans, would you like to go? I mean, it was like asking me, would you like to breathe today? Oh, yeah, I'd like to breathe today. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. Um, this was not a hard decision for me. This is like, absolutely, let's go. Let's go spend some focused attention with some kids that are not wanted. This is a, this is a no brainer. Another verse that, that I really felt was compelling for me, it says in, in 1 John 3, 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Wow! You want to talk about kicking me in the shins? That one hurt. Notice it does not say, uh, if anyone who is from the government and would like to give a handout, please go to those in need and love them. It does not say that. This, this command, is, it's a call for personal involvement to all Christians. It's not just a command for a department in the church. Helping the poor is not something we just leave to a committee. It is something that all of us are commanded and called to do. It is something that proves who we love. If anything, it proves that God is greater than us and that we have our priorities in line. So we took the trip. And now we get to the fun pictures, kind of give you guys a little bit of background. I told you a little bit about the history of the country, how they've been oppressed and how they've been occupied for, for over 50 years. They've, had, uh, they've been occupied. Riga is the big red star right there. Uh, my sister-in-law likes to call this the goldfish. Uh, I think it does look like a goldfish. Back of the dorsal fin there is Riga. Uh, the total population of Latvia is about two million people, and a, a million of them live in that one city. Uh, Liapaya and Dogapils, the two red dots on the outside, they both have about 350,000 each. So that leaves about 300,000 people scattered about the rest of the country. Uh, we went to Sasis, which is right above the T in Latvia. Uh, it was about a two-hour drive to get there. Uh, the roads look a lot like this, uh, most places. Uh, when there is pavement, it's very bumpy pavement. Uh, it's very hostile roads uh, to some extent. <laughs> They're not comfortable sleeping roads. If, if you're looking for a two-hour nap to get to Sasis, you're not going to get it. Um, so when we got there, the kids were on their bikes. Uh, this is not their driveway. This is actually the, one of the main roads going in there. Um, they, they were about two miles from the house, and they insisted on escorting us the way. So it took forever to go that last two miles. Um, we had Otis and Samantha and Cynthia in these pictures. 
this is the house. Now, don't be fooled. It looks like a mansion. Well, it, it does look beautiful, and it really could be beautiful. Um, but the windows are cracked. There's mice running in and out of the house. There's, you know, an inch of dust on the floor. Um, it, it, it's actually qu quite um, amazing compared to what they had, actually. Uh, I really think God's hand has been very divine and providential in, in uh, leading my uncle and uncle's wife in getting this place. They had a little tiny house, and they had all these kids coming in. And they, he's, he's a uh, professor at a university there. He's a theolo uh, teaching theology. Um, and he's also uh, has a church there. Um, so what happens is a lot of people in the country will have these poor destitute people and they don't have anywhere to put them. So he takes them in. And what happened is he had a little house called the Zavanyaki house. And it was the bell makers is what the Zavanyaki means. And that it was just, they outgrew it. And there was a guy who was building this mansion to be a bed and breakfast and he died. And his son didn't really want to have anything to do with the bed and breakfast. So providentially he started selling pieces of it off to my uncle. And now he has this house. There are so many rooms in this house, we actually lost count of trying to figure out how many rooms were in the house. Um, and we couldn't figure out how many kids were actually in the house. Um, people were coming and going all week while we were there. Some of the kids were going off to camp. Some of the kids that had been adopted were coming back to visit. And we couldn't tell who were the adopted kids and who wasn't. And not being able to speak the language, was, was it was difficult. Um, I prayed for the gift of tongues, and God did not give it to me while I was there. <laughs> so I really, I really wanted to preach to these kids, I could not. Um, so anyway, that's the house we stayed in. Uh, Latitude-wise, you've got to think of Juneau, Alaska. We're way up in the uh, northern hemisphere of the globe. Um, this is at uh, 10, 11, and 12 o'clock at night these pictures were taken. They were in the summer solstice time. There, there was 12, uh, 18 hour days, um, very little dark. Even when it got dark, it really didn't get dark. It's almost like the sun went and set and then went horizontally for four hours and then came right back up. It was kind of, it was crazy because you never, you, you couldn't really get your days and time straight. It was, it was interesting. They, uh, they had a horse there. Uh, this horse was going to the glue factory, which I don't understand how you make glue out of horses, but somehow he was, he was scheduled to go to the glue factory. And then they found out about the Zavanyaki and they said, would you want this horse? And they said, well, absolutely. Um, they have some mentally handicapped children at the, at the, at the house. And this is kind of like the horse therapy. If you've ever heard of the horse therapy, that, that's what they do with this. They, the kids will go ride it every night, and uh, even the mentally challenged kids will, will kind of adjust. It's really amazing to watch the, these animals, how they're gentle around people that, that aren't quite all there. Uh, so they had goats. They, uh, they would milk the goats every day. They'd go out and uh, feed the goats, and the goats would, even though they had a pen, they'd let them wander all over the place. You'd wake up in the morning, you'd come out, and there'd be a goat standing at the front door and kind of shell shock you a little bit so at times. You'd think, wow, they're loose. And they're, they're not loose. They just herded them, herded them back into the pen uh, when they needed to. So pictured here is Liga and Ilmars. Ilmars, uh, his story, he was born very healthy. Um, but because his uh, grandmother was an alcoholic, uh, she did not feed him. And he became very malnourished. And by the time he was age seven, he had all kinds of problems. Uh, he was no longer a healthy child. Uh, he had a habit where if you've seen people, they kind of rock. He did that often. Um, very intelligent boy. And I, the, the hope is that maybe he'll be able to leave the house one day, but maybe not. Um, there's, there's him and there's two other mentally handicapped people there that the other two for sure will never leave the house. They're there for life. Ilmar's, he may have a shot of recovering still. Um, he, he was kind of neat. He came up, I had a shirt that said Florida on it. He kept coming up, Florida, reading it on my shirt. And he was very proud of himself that he could read that. Uh, Ivar's picture here with the duck, he was, he was my best buddy while I was there. And uh, Edvin was probably a close second to being my best buddy. He, he followed us around quite a bit. Ivar's, uh, came, I'm not sure what age he came to the Zavanyaki. I, I kind of got different stories from different people on that. Um, but I do know when he came, um, <laughs> this was hard. I had to keep myself from thinking about it while I was there because I would get emotional. He was kept in a pit in the backyard because people in that country don't view mentally handicapped people as people. He was treated like a dog or like a, an animal. So when he got to the Zavanyaki, the only two words he knew how to say were yes and no. Fortunately, God has loosened his tongue. He had a lot more to say uh, by the time we got there. In fact, he would not stop talking to me. Um, 
he loved to take his little duck out of his pocket and go quack, quack, and just put it on my shoulder. And, you know, he was just a happy-go-lucky guy, just a wonderful human being. And uh, he, he was my buddy. Uh, so Ed Veen, who's, who's actually 12, he's a little guy for 12, um, but he had some, some sight problems. And one of the times we went out walking, uh, there was a scarecrow in the field. And, I mean, it wasn't more than... 10 feet from us, and he thought it was a person, and he would go up. It was funny at the time, but it's kind of sad now to think about it. That his, his eyesight is so bad that he couldn't tell that that wasn't a person. And he started getting really annoyed that this maiden in the field wouldn't talk back to him, because he's the kind of person that he's really chatty. And, he's, and he wasn't afraid to, to try to learn English either. He would, he would practice all kinds of English. He, at the end, he kind of had some mangled words, and we think he was trying to say something in English to us, but he, or at least he thought it was English when he was talking to us, but we had no idea what he was saying. It wasn't Latvian or English by the time we left. So, <laughs> um, But he was a great little kid. Uh, so, oh, the firewood there, there's a picture of that firewood there for a reason. Um, a lot of times you think, well, the mentally handicapped, they can't, they can't do anything. Well, Ivar's, his main job was, was getting the mulka, the firewood. And he was great at it. Uh, they spend most of their summer getting firewood because just like they have uh, 18 hours of daylight, they only have four hours of daylight in the wintertime. Um, so they're very dark and very cold and very harsh winters. So they spend a lot of time collecting firewood. And he is extremely useful as a person and to this family and to that Zivanyaki because he, he has the job and the integrity of going out there and doing something for the family. He goes and he collects firewood and he does a fantastic job. And he did a great job helping me with all the chores I was doing there. Um, they have, this was a little bit kind of strange, um, the Latvians really got us on the cold water thing. Uh, the polar bear plunge is nothing uh, compared to what they do. They do it every day. Um, they, have a, they have a pond a little bit down the road, and then further down the road they have a lake. And the, the water is ice cold, and these people get in it every day. Rain, sunshine, whatever, they get in it because they think it's healthy for them, I think. And they, they will jump in it, even for a second, and then they will get out. There were days that was just, it was cold. I didn't even want to go outside. It was raining, and it was just shiver cold just walking out the door. And they were walking in a big group every day down to these ponds, jumped in and jumped out and come back up. So uh, they put the polar bear plunge to shame, I think. This was the main attraction. You'll notice it's a trampoline without sides. If some of you are healthy, conscious, or worried about broken arms, thank God nobody broke an arm while we were there. But this is, this was, you'd see this almost every day, these kids would be jumping on this trampoline out there having a good old time. Uh, Ingrid went out and played Ring Around the Rosie. We're not really sure if they understood the words or they just had fun doing it. Um, and then, uh, so we uh, tried to play kickball with them one day. We tried to kind of build them up every day. We were doing a little bit more sports and more activities with them. And uh, we trying to teach the concept of running the bases. And uh, even Ivar's, uh, with his mentally challenged, he had no problem picking up the idea, I've got to run to here and then wait. And then I've got to run to here and wait. And he was just all smiles playing this game with us. So uh, Peyton brought his glove and his hat and all kinds of stuff. And by the end of the week, he left Atis his glove. And he left him his hat from the baseball season. Uh, so we graduated from kickball to baseball. Uh, my sister-in-law found a piece of lumber. And uh, we found kind of a small ball that we were pitching to him. And, and they were killing it. They were having a great time. Um, even one of the adults joined us. This is Rollins in the middle there. Uh, Rollins is kind of, he's another one that's got a sad story. He's a, he's a very short fellow, very gentle spirit. But because of his shortness and because of, I guess, he's not physically big, he was abused as a kid. His dad would uh, kick him and all kinds of things. And uh, you'd never know it because he was just the most kind and gentle spirit that you'd talk to when we were there. But um, he would hide in cupboards and things like that as a kid because his dad just abused him. So he's, he's there helping out at the Zivanyaki. Uh, one of the things we, uh, Sienna turned 12 while we were there. Um, this is her on the left-hand side, what they do on birthdays is they like to put you in a blanket and not just throw you. I mean, they really get you up in the air. Um, Sienna was scared out of her mind. <laughs> I don't know if you really could see how she's kind of curled up there like, please don't kill me kind of thing. Um, but it was a good time. Uh, they, the other thing they did that was kind of special, they, they had a lantern, kind of like if you watch the movie Entangled, where they uh, put a little flame at the bottom and just end this thing up. And I, 
I just, I found it kind of crazy that here we were putting something on fire and throwing it up in the air. And <laughs> it's going to come down somewhere. I, I kind of half expected like a barn to be burned down the street or something and don't know where that fire came from. Um, anyhow, so, so not something you would do here. I don't think you could get away with putting a, something on fire up in the sky here. Um, one of the things that I found interesting also is they, they don't, they only eat meat on special occasions because of their poorness. Um, so we, they, they had a grand time when we were there. So we arrived, they had chicken when we got there. This was a special treat. And then we had a birthday with Sienna, and that was a special treat. And another one of the little girls had a birthday. So they, they had meat three times when we were there. And that was a really, they were eating, eating the life. They were really loving it that we were there. Um, I cannot eat into a piece of chicken now without thinking of them now. It's, it's pretty amazing. So there's this bus. Uh, it's not really pictured well here. I, probably chose poorly on the pictures. Um, it was a nine passenger bus uh, on, on a bad day. It was a nine passenger bus. On a good day, it was about a 20 to 30 person bus um, because we would cram into this thing like sardines and they would drive us all over the country to show us things. It was quite amusing trying to get in and out of this van. One of the things that we did, we went and uh, we picked lettuce by the creek bed. There was a s special kind of lettuce that they put in their salads and we'd go down to the creek bed and everything that they ate, they pretty much they picked or grew right there on the farm. They had chickens and all kinds of things and eggs. So imagine uh, not really having produce unless you go out and get it yourself out of your own garden. This is the world that they live in. Um, it was very rare for them to go out to the store and buy lots of produce. Um, they, what you're not seeing pictured in here and I'm probably giving an injustice, is, is the mosquitoes. Uh, this place, uh, Chicoteague and Assateague, man, they can't hold a candle to this place. This place was unbelievable. Uh, they, they, I believe these were the saber-tooth variety of mosquitoes. <laughs> they, um, they, I, I kid you not, they, they cast shadows. They were, they were, they were some big mosquitoes. Um, Nick, poor Nick, after this trip, his arm was so bit up with mosquitoes, it looked deformed when we got back. We had to give him Benadryl to get the swelling down from all the bug bites he had from this trip. Um, one of the other things that we did, we went to the Baltic Sea. We just piled into the van and went two hours out to the sea. Um, uh, Sandra is this beautiful lady up here on the right-hand side, and the goofy guy with the hat is Ingrid's uncle. That's Eurus. Uh, they are the legal guardian of all these children, um, and they're the ones that, that are taking care of them. So some of the things that we did while we were there, they, they were having a, a chicken problem, or more a fox problem. The foxes were digging under the fence and getting the chickens. So what we did is we dug out a trench around all the fences, and then we buried more fencing down there and then backfilled it with dirt. So if the fox did dig, he'd have to start way farther back because if he started up against the fence, he'd dig down and hit fence. Um, so we kind of shored up the chicken problem. Uh, the cabinets and the kitchen, everything was just kind of falling apart. The windows were all cracked. I spent a lot of time trying to fix up cabinets um, just so they, the handles wouldn't fall off and things like that. Um, I built them a new little chicken coop because they went and bought some new little chickens. And uh, I, t I built a fox trap. I don't know if the fox trap actually worked because I didn't finish it till the last day before we left. Um, but we did make a fox trap to try to at least catch these foxes and get them out of there. The girls cleaned up the kitchen one day. They went in and just scrubbed it all down um, because it was pretty bad. This is uh, them going out and buying chickens. Uh, replacing some of the chickens. Um, we had gone to Oriental Trading Magazine and we had gotten all kinds of crafts and things for building, uh, making jewelry, and we got some fabric stuff to write shirts on. We took a whole bunch of shirts so they could design their own shirts. So we kind of had like an extended VBS week with them almost, um, without the, the Bible part because we couldn't speak a lick of Latin really. But, um, we had a good time with them. We gave them a lot of focused attention. And uh, it's amazing what a lot of focused attention will do to a child's life. Um, on the last day, uh, some very special people, I'm not going to mention their names, the barons, but they gave us some money for our kids. And they said, I want you to go out and I want you to let the kids go buy something for these kids. Uh, so what we did is we went to a store. It was kind of like a Walmart. And uh, we bought them all kinds of things uh, to leave them as presents and gifts. And uh, we, if you can see Ivar's there. Uh, Ivar's, we gave him a Donald Duck. So we, this, was, this was the American version of the duck. We called the duck, it was already in his pocket, the Latvian duck, and we gave him the American duck. Um, so I'm going to throw some statistics out at you, just to kind of level set you now. 
Uh, these are from uh, the U, uh, no, International Justice Mission has these statistics if you want to find out more. 963 million people go hungry every year. About 16,000 of people in that figure are children, and they die of hunger <coughs> daily. That's one every five seconds. So after the sermon's over, maybe like a million have, have died because I'm going to go so long. Um, but the UN believes that the world health and nutrition problems could be met with an additional 13 billion a year. Uh, and this is the thing that grabs me. US and Europe spend more than that in pet food in a year. Now, I'm pro-dog. I like dogs. Not so much cats, but I'm pro-dog. Um, it is a really sad indictment if we spend more on our pet food than we do on helping the poor. So what do we do? There's a problem with numbers. There's a problem with throwing statistics out like that. One is you can kind of make numbers say anything you want them to say. And two, there's no faces with numbers. You, you don't really get, you, these, aren't, these aren't numbers, they're faces. They're people behind these numbers. And, I, and what I hope, what you hear and what you see today is these are some of the faces behind those numbers. And I, I, what troubles me when I read statistics like that is you know, you hear these things, and some people aren't even inconvenienced by these numbers. They're not even moved by the numbers. It doesn't even do anything to them. Maybe it's because there's no faces. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm breaking down here. So we're not even moved. We're not even inconvenienced by these numbers. Some of the other things that we did uh, there, we, we went to uh, Eurus' church in Riga, and it's a lot like the Elizabeth House here in Laurel. Uh, people would line up behind the door, and we'd funnel them in, and they'd sit down, and we'd feed them. Um, just kind of the dire straits that they're in. In, in the summertime, they feed, uh, I think we fed between 65 and 80 people that day. In the wintertime, it's about 200 people. Um, and it really is a poor man's food. I mean, it was just soup and porridge. and. It wasn't even a whole banana. Uh, we had to slice up the bananas in little bite-sized pizzas, so everybody got a piece of a banana. Um, it, so uh, one of the families that gave to us was our, was our neighbors across the street. And he's not, the guy is not even a believer. Um, and he, he says, I, I, just, I know you Hubers, and I know you're going to go feed the world, so here, take some money. It was unsolicited money at that, even. Uh, the people that gave to us, it was unreal um, how before we took this trip, that people were just giving us money and said, I know what you're about to do, and I believe in what you're about to do, and I want to give you something to go over there and do something with it. Um, it was very humbling to have that kind of... This is the crew that helped that day. They, they usually have just four people. They had eight of us that day, so they were, they were loving life with all the help that they had. Uh, another place that we gave a donation to was a, a missions place. We, we got there a little late. It was 10.15. They were supposed to start at 10. Um, but what they do at this place is uh, this church has decided they put all the staples together, basically all the things that people really need in the family, the kind of things that you would get weekly at the uh, grocery store. They have about 65 families. Well, the people are just so desperate to have their staples or their little bit of food. They were all there 8 o'clock in the morning, lined up at the door. So even though they, they're not technically giving the food out till 10, these people had come at 8, and the church, I guess the people were there early enough, they were like, well, we'll just help them. And so by the time we got there, 15 minutes late, there was one person left. Uh, and we went to help. Um, we couldn't help, but we, we did at least leave them a donation to help them. Um, so this is Riga. This is the, the, big, the big city. Um, some of the things that are left over that are kind of staring at your face. In the bottom left-hand corner here, this is, this is what they call Stalin's cakes. Anytime Stalin took over a country, uh, the major capital, he would build this structure. They call it Stalin's cake. And we think up here is some leftover Soviet hangars. They turn that into a mall. Um, so there's this, everywhere you look, there's this, even though they've, you know, they, they're independent now, they're free of the Russians, there's this thumbprint that's left on them. And it's in the architecture. It's in, it's in the people's faces. It's everywhere. Um, this is the monument in the city called the Freedom Monument. They weren't even allowed to visit this during the occupation period. Um, they, they now they have guards sitting out there, and there's flowers lined up around this monument. Um, these are some of the when the when the Russians deported the Latvians, they also imported their own peasant population. It's estimated about 750,000 of their own peasant population flooded the country into Latvia. 
So that you, what you find there is a lot of people that speak Latvian, a lot of people that speak Russian, and then some that speaks both and some that don't. Um, so there is this tug of war that still, even though they're free, they're, they're, they're still Russianized to some extent. Uh, there's a considerable amount of Russians uh, there. Uh, they built these, this, this is actually, I think, a home that somebody actually lives in. That's not just a condemned looking building. That has actually people living in it. Uh, what they did is they erected these buildings, um, you know, that some six stories, some five stories, some different size, shapes, and things like that. But the average, what we kind of gathered was the fact that uh, when they flooded the country, they built these things. They had no air conditioning. They had one bathroom and one kitchen on every floor. And about 20 families would share that one bathroom and one kitchen. And they didn't have any elevators to get up and down the floors. And it's just like, wow, that's how they infiltrated the country. And they were all over the place, these buildings. It was like a scourge on the land everywhere you saw these buildings. Um, this is a, these are Latvian homes. Um, and these are typical, what you saw there. What, what struck me is when we rode down the, the main river, uh, you saw all these houses. They're run down, but you didn't see any boats. I mean, you see prime real estate here in the U.S., and, and people want that waterfront property, and they have these magnificent boats. There was almost no boats anywhere in the water. I mean, that's how poor they are. They have this great land, great front, waterside front property, and nobody owns a boat. Um, kind of strange. Uh, this is, this is Aluxna. We uh, went to visit Ingrid's dad's uh, original family home. This is where he grew up. This is also the, the church uh, that he probably attended when he was a small boy. There, this is also a famous town because this is where the first Latvian translated uh, the Bible into Latvian. Um, I, I thought it was kind of funny, the picture on the, there, that it's not them saying, we're going to beat you over the head with a Bible. That was actually just a warning, but going into the building, they were doing some construction on the steeple just to watch out for debris. Um, this is Opa's farm that was taken from him. When the Russians came in, they had pieces of paper that basically said, see this paper? It says we can take your land and you have to leave. Um, and if they, the, uh, I don't think the Howard County, Howard County, you know the little bumper stickers that say choose civility? Now, I don't think they realize that there's a communist, a, there's a communist, that's kind of a communist phrase. I don't think they realized that when they put that out. Otherwise, I don't think they would have done it. But what would happen is when the Russians would come in, they would say, be civil, choose civility. You know, don't make us kill you for your land, just leave, kind of thing. So there was this idea of just choose civility or else we're gonna kill you anyhow, and which they did. Um, Ingrid's grandfather was killed. Her other grandfather was taken to the Siberian prison camp. And uh, just by divine providence, her parents made it to this country and gave me a beautiful wife. Um, these flowers that are down here on the left-hand side, the, the lady that was living there was kind enough to give us flowers and said, I want you to have flowers from your father's land. And uh, it was very nice. This is the Latvian White House. You notice there's two guards sitting outside. Uh, I think we could have just knocked on the door and said, hey, can we see the president today? And they would have been like, sure. <laughs> it was, it, this, is, this is really, no kidding, this is their White House. This is where their president was. And you could walk just that close to the building. As you can see, Nick standing there with the two guards pacing back and forth. The guards were in sync with each other. It was really funny. They, they would walk, and they would just kind of do their little walk. And I almost kind of, you know, because I like Westerns, I, I, I kind of waited for them. I wanted them to turn around and aim at each other, but they, <laughs> they never did. So... They just kept walking back and forth. Um, another tradition I thought was kind of cool is on the bridges in Latvia, you'd see these locks all over the place. And what it is is people would get married, and they would engrave the lock on the day that they got married. And what they would do is they would lock the lock on the bridge, and then they would throw the key in to kind of like signify that, hey, we're not breaking up. We're locked in. I, I really, I'm a very strong proponent for marriage, so I was really pleased to see this tradition. I really liked it. Uh, this is... Uh, I really don't know what to say about this guy. <laughs> I, I just threw, I told Ingrid, I says, I, I should wear something like that at the church and say, I'm going European style today. And um, they, every guy out there had their man purse. It was, it was kind of interesting. This dude, I, he, was, he was something. I don't know what to say. Um, so we went to the beach one day, and uh, I noticed the signery. Now, I, I thought this was a universal sign. It's not lit, written in Latvian. It's not written in English. Uh, it, you see it says no smoking, uh, no dogs, no fires, and no cars. That seems pretty clear. It looks universal. Yet, sure enough, there was a vehicle, <laughs> pile of wood. I don't know what they're going to do with it. A guy smoking and a dog. You can't, the dog can't read the sign, so I, I don't blame the dog too much. Um, 
That's it. These are just some of the things that we saw there. Uh, anyhow. So not to mention names again, uh, Barons, Beals, and Williams, and Hyatt's, uh, but they <laughs> were very generous. Uh, I don't mean to embarrass them, but they, they, they were some of the people that gave to us. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that struck me, we didn't get to stay, uh, Ingrid's mom stayed a little bit longer than us, and there was a place that was kind of a pregnancy crisis center. Um, at the Pukai, Puka Penyani, or I can't say it. I'm sure they're laughing at me, because um, her sister's here. You're not saying it right. Anyhow, they, they, she walked in, literally, she had one of Cheryl's blankets, and she held it up, and she says, could you guys use something like this? And the woman looked, her eyes got this big, and she said, we could use it now. And she grabbed the blanket and ran off for about five minutes. Apparently, there was a, a woman upstairs that had a baby, and they didn't have any blankets for her. And, they used it right that minute. I mean, she didn't even have time to greet and talk to my, my mother-in-law. She, she actually left her standing there on the stoop like, OK. <laughs> so for five minutes, she walked off and came back and then said, yes, we could use those kind of things here. Um, so that was a pretty touching story. Um, the, the other things that we, toys, chickens, and gas, we bought for the Zavonyaki. Um, we helped out the, the, the soup kitchen. Uh, the mission center, and uh, we bought school supplies. There's the poorest of the poor. They can't, they can't go to school unless they have their school supplies. So if you don't have your school supplies, tough luck. No education for you. So what we did is that, that some of the poorest of the poor, there's a, a foundation. I guess they're collecting money so all these kids can have their school supplies so they can go to school. So we gave to that as well with some of the contributions that we got. All right, so let's sum it up. Uh, so, does God care for the needy? Yes, God cares for the needy. Why does God care for the needy? It's for His glory. Absolutely for His glory. Who are the needy? Well, tough question, a lot of answers to it, uh, but we at least know it's the orphans. Can you think of anybody that doesn't have a voice? It has to be the orphans. Can you think of anybody, a city without walls? It has to be the orphans. Can you think of anybody any more defenseless than an orphan? Uh, should we care for the needy? Absolutely, we should care for the needy. The question is how? How do you do this great thing, caring for the needy? And that I need to turn you to this. Proverbs, it says, It is a sin to despise one's neighbor. Blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Also in Proverbs, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will reward them for what they have done. Now, helping the poor is not something you're going to do by accident. It's got to be intentional. You're never going to just up and see the guy at Walmart and just check off the box, I gave him a nugget today or I gave him something. That's not what helping the poor is. If you think that's what helping the poor is, then you better put mute on because I'm going to say some things to you you're not going to like. Paul, this is the early part of the church. The church has just been, just been founded. Christ has just left. Paul is now, he's going out to the Gentiles. For 14 years, he's been away from Peter. Peter's going out, he's going out, and he's trying to reach the Jews. In, the, in Galatians, he's talking about this. And they finally get back together, and they're having a meeting. And Paul, one of the things that they want to do, they want to reconcile, Paul says, I presented to them the gospel that I preached. What does Paul want to do? He wants to make sure that he wasn't running his race in vain. He says, if anything, make sure that we're, we are on the same page on the gospel. And what does he say? Yeah, they recognize the grace that was given to me. We got the same gospel. Great. What do you put second to the gospel? Buildings? Church politics? Worship styles? Maybe music ministry? No. Not what they put second. The early church, he says this. He says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. And then Paul says, he says, the very thing I was eager to do all along. You have to make it a priority. You have to be moved by the numbers. John Piper, uh, another theologian I like to hear, he says, the least developed countries are also the least evangelized countries. The poor are the lost, and the lost are the poor. So you don't have to struggle with this concept. You know, whether, you know, you got priority number one is the gospel. Priority number two is the poor. Well, should we, should we have a group that does evangelism to the poor and then another group that does you know, just evangelism? No. They're one and the same, John Piper says. You don't have to look for them. They're one and the same. You can evangelize because, you know what, the, the, the poorest of the poor are the least evangelized. They are the hard places. This is the places that people don't want to go. 
Matthew 9.36. When he, that's Jesus, saw the crowds. This is again God looking out. He's looking for us. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. This word compassion just really really sticks out to me. Um, you've, many of you have heard that the name of the movie Mel Gibson, The Passion of Christ. This is a, this compassion, it's a visceral term. It means his guts were torn out. It means he was moved. It means he didn't just hear the numbers. It's like God looked at us. He said, there's something wrong with them. They're in sin. They need a Savior. And he wasn't just looking at it and making a moral judgment on us. He had compassion. He was moved to do something about it. So he came and he saved us. When God decided to save the world, he didn't write a check. He came personally. He got involved. This is a, another verse that kind of stuck out to me in Isaiah. God was outraged with this church. They were, they were having great worship services. They were really playing church really well. They really knew what to do. They knew how to bring people in. They were playing church. But this is what Isaiah said. He says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing wrong. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. The fatherless. He says, yeah, you can do church, and you can play church really well, but what are you doing for the fatherless? What are you doing for the widow, those who have no voice? God was outraged with the injustice that was going around them because they weren't doing anything about it. You have to make it a priority. So... We finally arrived to my key passage. If you've been waiting to park yourself somewhere in the scripture, this is where I want you to park. John 13, 27, I believe answers all the questions that I've presented to you today. Um, and it starts here. Does God care for the needy? So Jesus, this is, he's at the Lord's Supper here. He's just finished the Lord's Supper. And they're sitting around. And, and Jesus told him, he says, he's looking at Judas. And they had just asked the disciples just asked, you know, who, who is it that's going to betray you? And Jesus said, well, the one that's going to dip is in this cup is the one that's going to betray me. So if I'm with the disciples, I'm going to be looking, okay, well, who's the next dude that gets his cup dipped in here, you know? But they don't. The story kind of unfolds in a kind of, it's like the disciples weren't really getting it. Um, so Jesus told him, he says, and he's talking to Judas, he says, what you are about to do, do it quickly. The time of waiting was over. God was moved with compassion at this point. <laughs> Aren't you glad he did it quickly? Aren't you glad he looked at us and he said, you're worth it, and he didn't hesitate? But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival. Or, notice this. Notice how much of a priority this was to Jesus. This is what they mistake. The night before he's about to be charade, this is what they, this is what they thought it was all about. To give something to the poor. Do what you're about to do, do it quickly. And what he's about to do is save humanity from our sins. What did they think he was doing? They thought he was going out to do something for the poor again. That's how much a part of this is. This is so near and dear to God's heart. The poverty, the poor. So why does God care for the poor? The following verses right here, he answers it. Judas has just left. And what is God talking about? What is Jesus, what's on his mind? He says, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And, he, and it was the night. And when he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in him, and will glorify him at once. What is in his mind? Glory. God's glory. Not his glory. God's glory. God's great name was on his mind. There's this concept of in him. This is a repeated theme also in the Bible, is this in him. God comes to the world. He creates the world. He dwells among his people in the, in the garden with Adam and Eve. He, he talks to the prophets. He gets to the point where eventually he dwells in a temple. And then the temple is removed. And then God comes most powerfully in the flesh. Why? To dwell with his people. Then God dies on the cross. He leaves. But guess what? He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell with his people, to be in him. And then one day, when we're gone from this world, we will dwell with him again. God is always trying to dwell with us. He's never not trying to be a part of your life. He's always trying to be in you and in Him. John says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is another verse that kind of kicks you in the shins, doesn't it? How do people know that you love God? Is it because 
do you give to the poor? Not necessarily. Is it because that you look for God's name and to make his name great to the nations through loving the poor? Yeah. I think that's the way. Now, it's, it's almost over. Jesus is about to be hung on a cross. And he says this. He says, uh, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. He's still not talking, done talking about God's glory. That your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life. This is it. This is everything. That they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you have gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Why is this so important? Why is it so important that we give to the poor? Why is it so important that we go out and take charge and be moved by the numbers and have compassion? Because virtually every world religion out there does something for the poor. If we don't go, there is a false gospel that is being preached among the nations that's going out. Every world religion does something for the poor, but they don't do is they don't tell them this. They don't tell them the truth about Jesus. We need to be moved by the numbers. We need to go out and do something about what is so concerning to God. And then finally, this is my last verse for you. I appreciate those who, who didn't look at their watch today. I apologize for taking you on a long trip. Do you love Jesus? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Again, God wants to dwell with you. Maybe you heard something today, and today's the day that you said to yourself, I want God to dwell with me. The God of the universe, the God that created the trees and everything that you can touch, smell, hear, I want that for my life. I want that. Maybe you've just been kicked in the shins a little bit like myself. And, and let me be honest with you, I'm nowhere near where I want to be with helping the poor and helping the needy. I, I'm just, I'm broken, just like anybody else. Uh, I am nowhere where I want to be. But today, if you just want to pray about this, if you just want to come up and say, you know, I, I want to help the needy, I don't know how. But you've said some things that are really just, they're eating at my heart. You know, I, I, the most humbling time for me, I think, is, is when we come budget time around here and we start looking at our priorities. Our wallet betrays us. It tells where our priorities are. We spend more on buildings than we probably ought to. We spend more on a lot of things. And we don't spend it on the poor. And it... And it bothers me to the point where where are we personally as a church as a family where where do we need to be where do we need to go from here i think the early church was founded on helping the poor and going out into the hard places and being compelled with compassion and being moved i think this is where we need to be i think this is the challenge i want to leave with you today if you love jesus go to the poor go to them and you don't have to wait for permission we didn't wait for permission we didn't, it, and you don't, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have experience. The Bible said anyone who has possessions and does not go to the poor and does not help their brother, it, it, all you have to have is a heart to go. So some practical ways to do this, maybe mentor Maryland. Maybe you need to think about foster home. Maybe you need to think about, uh, I don't know, there's lots of things, the pregnancy center. There's lots of ways to get involved and help the needy. Don't let today go by and not be changed by what you've heard today. So let's pray. Father, I just I pray that, that your word and your name was made great today. God, I pray that so much that, uh, that we cannot be the same person that we came in here as. God, that we cannot be moved. Uh, Lord, move us. Break our hearts to the point where we want to do something about it. Lord, just as Jesus, when he saw us, he was moved with so much compassion that he did something for us. He took care of our sin. God, I praise you for that atonement. I praise you for just loving us in that kind of way. And the fact that you did it quickly, that you didn't wait. And just like Paul, who was eager to help the poor, God, make us eager to help those who are less fortunate. God, break our hearts and put us in a place where we can go out to the rest of the world and help.